Is it recording? It says it's recording. Okay, it's recording. God, I'm an idiot. Okay, picking back up for the Brutal Fairy Tale Stray Dog Redemption. Picking back up where we last left off. I hope you are all enjoying the ride so far. Please let me know what you think in the comments down below. Please remember, I'm not a very good narrator, nor am I a good writer. But hey, work with what you got, even though what you got ain't jack squat, right? Moving on. Once Astroff's family arrived at their designation, his father honked the car's horn several times. He quickly sprung out from the car, finally able to stretch his legs, as the rest of the family were glad to be free from the steel-rolling prison cell. They were finally free and able to get out of, the, uh, get out of this damned car. As Astroff and Rook got out of the car, they looked around the street at everything. It looked as if Astroff himself was looking for someone hiding in the streets around them. The street seemed like nothing had changed since the last time they were here. However, they both knew that even here inside this city, monsters walk the streets in human skins. Human skins. The monster they were looking for was nowhere to be seen for now. At least. They knew that the monster was here, hiding in the city, watching, waiting, and hunting. Just waiting for Astroff and his four-legged brother to return to this accursed city. So it could prey on them once more. He didn't want to admit it, but he knew this beast all too well. It was a beast of his own creation, and he knew it. And he knew once it found him, there would be no hope left. All he could do was try to avoid it for as long as possible. After that, he would have to figure out, figure it out as he went along. At least for now, it didn't know he was back in this city. Back in this damned city. Blah, 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 blah. However, it would only be a matter of time before it found him. Then all hell would break loose around him. Scotty stepped out of the car and stretched out. She was all too relieved to finally be out of the car like the rest of them. She caught her reflection in the glass of her window. She saw that the bruises on her face were uh, starting to form. And she quickly... rubbed at them. <clears throat> she pushed against the side of her neck, po uh, pushed against the side of her chin, popping her neck right to left before she shut her car door.
She pushed one of her nostrils closed and blew as hard as she could through her nose. Her blood and snot shot out of her nostrils, smearing across the ground. Then... Oops. Then she pressed the other side shut and did the same, freeing her nose from her clotting blood. If nothing else, she had finally, if nothing else, she was finally relieved to be out of the, of the car. She was finally free and could not wait to spend some time away from her little brother. <clears throat> she looked across the car through the windows at her brother's back. She quickly started plotting how she would get him back for that for this later. That, however, was going to have to wait at least until her parents were gone. As the door to the house opened, Astroff and Rook quickly tor turned towards it. There they saw his grandparents. Stepping out of the house, Astroff and Rook were relieved to see it was just them. They themselves have not changed much since last year. Both of them were well aged and scarred from their time spent in war. In wars, both of them had a slight amount of gray and silver hair on their heads. They both had been together for so long. Oh, they both they had been together for as long as Astroff could remember. Even throughout the wars, their bonds for each other would not be broken. They lived together and would die without the other. In truth, they simply did not know how to live without the other anymore. They had been together for so long now that they could not even imagine life apart. They had their fights many times over, of course, like most couples do. However, they always seemed to make up somehow. At least they were genuinely happy together. If nothing else, they could could be said of them. One thing was for sure, the phrase, careful boys, I'm old for a reason, definitely fit them well. Both of them had come through two world wars together, and they were living their twilight years in peace. Astroff's grandmother had her short black and gray hair pulled back into a small ponytail, a golden cross tattooed on the middle of her forehead. Her hands were charred black and smoldering like her skin was on fire with faint embers glowing on her flesh. It ran all the way up to her elbows with several cracks within her flesh, tattooed in beautiful golden ink that had the words Ego Sum Lux on her right bicep and Ego Sum Via tattooed on her left. She had bright, cold, steel blue eyes that could easily pierce the souls of men. She wore a fine, sleeveless white summer dress and black leather boots. As for Astroff's grandfather, carefully walking down the stairs with a cane in his clockwork mechanical left hand, the words Lama Crush were engraved across its cold steel. And... 
I wrote that down, and I cannot even begin to pronounce it. Across the right, his right hand, his brown hair has so uh, his hair is brown with several silver hairs spotted a bout. He has the Knight family staple, royal emerald green eyes. He wore, he was wearing his old combat boots, gray jeans, and a leg brace like Astros on his right leg, and a white long sleeve shirt under a red waistcoat and black tie. Astroff waved at his grandfather. Uh, waved at his grandparents before he and Rook walked off down the street. Down the street, they walked as quickly as their legs could carry them without running. He was happy to see his grandparents. However, he had been trapped in the car with his family for hours on end. Now, he and Rook had been with them for far too long, for right now they needed some time away from his family. A little time together without being... A uh, little time together would not be so bad right now. After all, it's not like his grandparents were going anywhere anytime soon. They had been in this world for over 50 plus years and were not about to leave it now. For now, at least, Astroff and Rook had other things to attend to. They had other things that they had to handle right now as quickly as they could. Astroff, where the hell do you think you're going, young man? His father shouted as he noticed them walking off down the street. To apply for my summer job, Dad, just like last year. You fucking dumbass. Astroff shouted back. However, he said the last part a lot quieter than the rest. What was that last part? His father shouted at them. However, Astroff did not reply back to his father. He simply kept walking on his way. They would deal with that problem when it came time. Well, it would deal with that problem when it came up later. For right now, he just needed to get away from his parents. Just let them be. Oh, just let the boy be, son. The grandfather said to his son as he patted his shoulder. It's good to see you, May, and you, too, Jack, Astroff's mother, said, holding out her hands towards her mother-in-law. It's good to see you, too, Victoria, May said, shaking Victoria's hand. How have you been doing, Tiber? Jack asked as he bent down to pick up a case. Dad, be careful, Astroff's father said as he grabbed his father's shoulder. Boy, my leg is shot. Not, oh sorry. Boy, my leg is shot to shit, not my back. Jack stated as he picked up the case and stared at his son. Before they headed inside of the house. Ugh. Ugh. Once Astroff and Rook got far enough away, Astroff reached into his pocket and pulled out a small metal case and a Zippo lighter. He opened the case and pulled out a cigarette. He lit the cigarette and took 
in a lung full of smoke as he continued walking down the streets. Both he and Rook kept their guard up. <sighs> For they knew at any moment the monster Astro feared would show up. It would only be a matter of time before it showed itself to them. Astroff did not want to deal with this today. He did not have the strength to deal with it right now. However, he knew that soon he would have to deal with it once and for all. As Astroff thought about the monster, a young blonde-haired girl quickly ran out from an alleyway and shot past Astroff. Rook barked violently at her as she ran down the street. Astroff watched as the girl ran away, but his attention was quickly drawn to an alleyway. So, oh, was quickly drawn to the alleyway the girl ran out from. As the sounds of a fight erupted from the alley, Astroff quickly clung to the wall of the building as he carefully looked around the corner. There, he saw five older boys beating down a younger boy, wearing old, worn-out, torn overalls. Astroff pulled his head back around the corner and turned to Rook. This doesn't concern us, Rook. We should keep moving, Astroff explained coldly. Rook softly growled at Astroff, letting him know that he meant what he was saying. Astroff just rolled his eyes and nodded his head, knowing that there was no point in arguing with his brother. Rook, Rook, was, Rook was right after all. Helping the young boy was the right thing to do. That, or he was just itching for a fight. After all, they were stuck in that car, in that long car ride for so long to get here, and Astroff's blood was still boiling after the f his fight with his sister and dealing with his parents. Maybe fighting five older boys was a bad idea, but at least it would help blow off some steam and pent up aggression. At the very least, they really had nothing better to do at the moment. Just who was he really uh, just who was he really to say no to a little gratuitous violence? Astroff quickly popped his knuckles and patted his brother's head before making the decision. You're right, like always, Rook, Astroff said as he took one last puff of his cigarette. Game on. He stated as he blew out the smoke. They walked around the corner together. Astroff pushed his chin side to side, popping his neck. Whoops. What the hell did I just do? There we go. He let out a loud whistle, drawing the older boy's attention before he flicked his cigarette at one of the older boys. As the boy noticed the lit cigarette flying towards him, the boy quickly shot up his hand to protect his face. As the boy put his hands up, blocking his line of sight, Astroff rushed up onto him and drove his knee into the older boy's stomach with all of his might. As the older boy bent over in pain, Astroff slammed his hands into the boy's ears, discombobulating him. Then, whoops, god dang, how do I keep doing that? 
Then he grabbed the boy's head and quickly pulled it down. As he did, he rocketed up his right knee into the boy's face, shattering the boy's nose, knocking him to the side. Next, Astroff asked calmly, looking at the others. One of the older boys grabbed Astroff and threw him in to a trash can. Three of the older boys started stomping onto Astroff as he hit the ground. Astroff grabbed a boy's leg and quickly pulled it out from under him. As the boy fell over, he quickly tried to, to get up. Astroff punched the side of the boy's knee, making a crunching sound echo from his leg. As Astroff broke the older boy's kneecap, another boy grabbed Astroff and threw him against the wall. The older boy grabbed Astroff's face and slammed the back of his head against the wall before throwing him back onto the ground. Another boy kicked Astroff in the side of his head, forcing his head to slam into a trash can. Are you stupid or do you just have a death wish or something? One of the boys asked before kicking Astroff in the face again. Astroff didn't answer the boy. He just looked up at him before punching the boy straight in his testicles. Rook quickly bit down on the other boy's forearm and pulled him down off from Astroff. Rook tried not to kill the boy, only wanting to hold him down. If Rook wanted to, he could tear the boy apart with ease. The boy screamed in pain as Rook's teeth broke through his flesh right down to the bone. The taste of blood covered Rook's tongue. The older boy punched Rook with all of his strength, but Rook didn't let go. He only... Whoops. He only forced his jaws down and snapped the boy's bone, or snapped the bone in the boy's arm in half with a sickening snapping sound. After that, he tackled the boy onto the ground and tore into his chest with his claws. As the boy stood, as, as the boy standing over the younger one quickly went to help his friends, the younger boy quickly slammed his fist into the side of the older boy's knee, snapping, snapping it, forcing him onto the ground. The younger boy quickly crawled up and grabbed the back of the older boy's head. The younger boy lifted the older boy's head up before slamming his face into the ground with all of his might. The impact broke the older boy's nose and face onto the hard ground. The younger boy slid the older boy's face side to side against the cold stone ground, smearing the ground in blood as the older boy's flesh was ripped off his face. The younger boy tried to grind the older boy's face off onto the ground. As Astroff tried to get up, the last older boy kicked him on his head, knocking his head up. Then the boy kicked him again, this time driving his heel, driving the heel of his boot into Astroff's right eye, forcing him back into the trash can. Astroff looked up at the at the boy as his blood dripped from his head. He has had enough of this, and his right hand quickly reached into his trench coat. Make sure what time I'm at. Okay. Hey, you kids, stop right there, an adult's voice shouted, echoing through the alleyway. Just then, several adults... 
in the city watch uniform, came running into the alley. Astroff quickly removed his hand from inside his trench coat. The older boys quickly recovered themselves the best they could and ran away as fast as they could. As one of the watchmen and his full-grown Marroller stopped to check on Astroff and Rook and the younger boy, the rest of the watchmen quickly chased after the older boys. They chased them down and out of the alleyway towards who knows where. At least the city watch was not going to have an except exceedingly long chase, judging by the older boys' injuries they had received. At least that little problem was over and dealt with now. Those older boys were the city's problem now, not Astroff's. Maybe after a few nights in the hospital, then followed by a couple of weeks of juvie, they would learn their lesson about not harassing people on the street. Maybe a few long weeks of cleaning up the city would teach the, bo teach the boys a valuable lesson on behavior. At the very least, they were not Astroff's problem anymore. <sighs> Astroff looked at the watchman's Marroller. Uh, it was a different breed than Rook, but they both are descendants of the Black Beast himself. She had a long, streamlined body with long, strong legs for running and a long tail for quickly turning mid-sprint. Long, floppy ears to help dig up the scent in the dirt. Short, brown and black fur with deep blue eyes. She was a swift paw, a true hunting dog if there ever was one and was truly built for the chase to the very end. She quickly sniffed Astroff and Rook, checking up on them. She barked happily at Rook before they circled each other. She, like Rook, knew that they are descendant... De uh, sorry, they are distant cousins of a sort. She looked back at her brother, wagging her tail as she barked at him. Almost everyone in Zion as a child has heard this tale. It was Astroff and Rook's favorite. The story of the Black Beast and the birth of the Mar Rollers. Long ago, a farmer was walking through the woods hunting for food when he stumbled across the black beast, a massive horned wolf-like beast whose hot breath was as fire, burning red eyes that said that was said to burn men's souls and jet black fur that was darker than the dark side of Zion. He was bound in ungodly heavy chains, heavy chains fused into his flesh, and a faded red ribbon around his neck. The black beast was injured from his fight with the dragon. The black beast was burnt down to his very bones from the dragon's scorching hot fiery breath. Beyond the black beast lay the dragon's headless, half-eaten corpse. As the beast saw the farmer, he quickly ran from the beast. The farmer quickly ran all the way to his house, fearing for his life. Once he was home, 
he went about his life. However, inside his heart, inside the farmer's heart, he knew that he could not just let the beast suffer in pain alone. So he gathered all the food and water in a pair of heavy bolt cutters and a metal saw and some medical supplies that he could carry on his back. In the following morning, The farmer slowly walked upon the black beast. He slowly gave the black beast the food and the water. As the black beast ate, the farmer petted his side. The farmer would not dare go near the beast's head. As the farmer tried to cut and remove the heavy chains on the beast, The black beast whipped around and pinned the farmer onto the ground. The black beast glared at him and growled. But the farmer would not give up on the beast. The farmer managed to calm the beast and finally freed him from the heavy chains. As each one of the chains hit the ground, it shook from the weight of the chains. The ribbon was the hardest to remove, but as he did, it hit the ground so hard that it cracked into the dirt. Then the farmer bandaged up the beast with what he had and did all that he could for him. The farmer led the beast to a cave where day after day the farmer would bring him food and water. Even after the beast's wounds had fully healed, the two slowly forged a bond stronger than the chains once bound into the beast's flesh. One day, the black beast dipped out his water from its bowl, if I can read for a second, and slit his throat on a stone. The beast poured its boiling blood into the bowl, filling it. As the bowl was filled of the boiling blood, the wound healed shut. The black beast made the farmer drink of his burning blood. Hesitantly, the, fa the farmer drunk the blood. It burned in his mouth, it burned in his throat, and it burned in his stomach. It hurt so bad that the farmer fainted. But when the beast, or when he awoke, he was not the same. The farmer could hear the black beast's voice in his head. Like the beast, the farmer found that he could heal as fast as the beast could. So, the deal was signed. The farmer would tend to the beast, and in return, the beast would protect the farmer and his family. One day, the hero of destruction was seen heading towards the farmer's village. The black beast quickly ran out to meet the hero. After a long, hard-fought battle, the beast was victorious, but was mortally wounded. The farmer stayed by his brother's side as he died. As the farmer wept over the black beast's body, a miracle happened in front of him. The black beast's body fell apart 
and brought forth new life from his remains. From his hide came the ironhide hound. From his muscles came the strong jaw, and from his bones came the swift paw. These new pups were born from the remains of the black beast and were part of him. The farmer reached out for the pups, but they walked past the but walked past him. He could not hear them speak to him, but the farmer's three sons could hear one of the hounds. To his oldest son, who was a soldier, the strong jaw bonded to keep his brother safe from his enemies. To the middle son, who was a hunter, the swift paw bonded so that no prey would escape them. And to the farmer's youngest son, who was a shepherd, the iron hide bonded to help watch over his flock. So from the black beast, the moraliers were born and spread throughout Zion. And I think that's a good spot to leave it at for right now. Uh... Kind of got off topic quite a lot. Was kind of having quite a lot of technical difficulties. Sorry about that. I hope you enjoyed it. Please leave a like, comment, share, subscribe. All that fun stuff if you would be as so kind. And do let me know what you think of the story thus far in the comment section down below. Thank you very much and have a beautiful day.